Hello, everyone. Thank you for bringing this sunshine. So I want to tell you a little bit about Chief Burke. Um, he is an insightful police leader focused on the national landscape of the profession and building a resilient organization. He's dedica a dedicated public servant committed to public safety, inclusion, and evolving the organization to meet the needs of the community. He has a strong background in police operations, organizational management, leadership by example with sharp focus on providing excellent police service aligned with community expectations. Please give a warm welcome to Chief Burke. Good afternoon. Oh, that's loud. I'm loud. <laughs> in fact, it's rare that they actually give me a microphone. Is that better? In the back of the room, you're good? OK. All right, so uh, thank you for that warm introduction. I appreciate that. I think a little bit more about my background, just to give uh, context of you know, how, I get, how I came to be the police chief here in the city of South Burlington. Grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York. My father was a police officer in Poughkeepsie for 20 years and retired. Uh, I thought. I was going to try my hand in agriculture. I went to school at Vermont Technical College after we moved to Vermont and studied ag business. And decided that that wasn't quite it for me and found my way into policing in 1994 with the town of Woodstock Police Department in central Vermont. I was there for two years before I applied to the Burlington Police Department where I was accepted as, as a new uh, rookie in 1997. And I spent about the next 22 years there uh, really doing every job from uh, patrol, field training officer, detectives, drug unit, all the way up until I retired from the city of Burlington in 2018. I was the uh, operations deputy chief of police, and also served as this, the police department's public information officer. 2018, I was fortunate enough to be hired by the city of South Burlington as the police chief uh, for this community and have uh, immensely enjoyed policing in South Burlington, where the, uh, really the legacy of the organization has been the police really embedded in the community, understanding from residents what the expectations of the department are, and uh, being community caretakers. And I think at this time in policing, uh, and we'll talk about this in greater detail, there's no better of a foundation than, than I was blessed to find when I got to the organization in 2018. Having said that, get into the presentation. I felt it was important that my computer work. <laughs> there we go. I think it's important to talk about uh, what the police department actually encompasses in terms of organizational structure, because oftentimes you just think of the parked police cars that you see traversing throughout the city, or officers on uh, on a sidewalk tending to a radio call. But there's so much more to our organization than that. So this is our uh, organizational chart. You'll see it starts with the chief. We have a deputy chief of police who is a, a new hire with us. His name is Sean as well, Sean Briscoe. He's with us uh, as a lateral candidate. He did his policing career in the city of Saratoga Springs, New York. We are responsible for command and control of the police department, policy and really philosophical direction of the police department. We uh, have a couple of team members up there with us. So we have our executive assistant that keeps us organized. And then we have our Community Justice Center. If you're not familiar with the South Burlington Community Justice Center, it's an entity of two employees, an executive director, and then a practitioner. And what they do is offer restorative justice, alternative justice, really through restorative practice for a variety of criminal offenses, low-level disorder. And then they also offer a program called Parallel Justice. So if you are a victim of a crime, say your car window is smashed, your mailbox is run over, uh, that team member calls every crime victim in the city to allow them to really some space to um, talk about their experience as a crime victim and then offer uh, you know, resources that are available to help them remedy their situation. So th that group in the Community Justice Center is really doing some fantastic work especially on the alternative prosecution side of the equation, where we are trying to get, particularly first-time offenders, into the restorative process where they can understand how an impulsive decision really negatively, negatively impacted not only the crime victim or the affected party, 
but more broadly the community as a whole. And how the community is represented in the process is we have a strong core of volunteers that support the Community Justice Center and they sit on panels and represent the community and their interests in how crime is felt across, uh, across town, if you will. <clears throat> so very proud of the work they're doing. Going south from uh, the command level, you'll see we have two lieutenants. So on your left and uh, on your right, we have a lieutenant over the patrol division. The patrol division right now is staffed with a total of 21 police officers. And those 21 police officers provide 24-7 police coverage to the city 365 days a year. They work a 12-hour shift with fixed days on and days off. What this affords us to do is with low numbers, you provide that level of service to the city, 24-7 coverage year-round. And it also provides us an opportunity to do that in teams. So each team is staffed by one sergeant, who is the person in charge, and three officers. And that aligns with the three patrol areas that we have in the city. Essentially, uh, they are, we call them the south, which is Shelburne Road. We have the middle, which we are conveniently in, which is essentially everything from the double tree down to Shelburne line, down to the Shelburne uh, town line on Dorset Street. And then everything uh, kind of east toward the airport from uh, 116 is the east uh, patrol area. So that's how we divide up the city. So there isn't uh, three cops all sitting in one spot, that they're out uh, dispersed and can respond to calls for service as needed in an efficient manner. <clears throat> also uh, assigned to our patrol division is our animal control officer. The animal control officer is actually a contract vendor that we use and uh, they provide a little bit of proactive patrol and then a lot of follow-up on things related to animal bites, dogs at large, uh, aggressive dogs, that kind of thing. <clears throat> on the right side of the chart, you'll see we have a lieutenant over administration. In administration, we have uh, a sergeant responsible for our dispatch services. So the police department houses the emergency communication or 911 center for the city. And we dispatch for both police, fire, and, and fire obviously has EMS. And that team has a total of seven dispatchers, and we staff that center 24-7, uh, 365 as well. That sergeant is also responsible for all of our in-service training. So as police officers in the state of Vermont, in order to maintain your certification, you have to have a minimum amount of training hours per year. And depending on the year, odd year or even year, suggests the disciplines in which those trainings need to be administered and we are accountable to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council for that. And uh, that is that sergeant's focus. The next sergeant <clears throat> over here is BCI, that's the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. So they do everything from pre-employment background checks to murder investigations. So we have a sergeant and currently two detectives that work specifically in South Burlington on cases such as that. And then we also have <clears throat> one detective assigned the Chittenden Unit for Special Investigations. What that is, the countywide group, and uh, there's subscribing police departments, Burlington, South Burlington, the Vermont State Police, UVM, Colchester. We all have detectives there, and they work on serious um, sexual assault and serious child abuse investigations. Really tough work, and we have a detective that uh, is assigned there for four-year increments because that is uh, probably really what I would call the rev limiter on how long an employee can actually be really embedded in that type of work. And then the last, uh, the last detective position here is uh, a, a member that we have assigned to the Vermont State Police Drug Task Force. So the, the State Police administers drug task force in the state and it's a really good way to uh, regionalize, collaborate, and force multiply through uh, these teams and investigate mid to upper level drug traffickers. <clears throat> this uh, column here, we have a vacant sergeant position, unfortunately, and that person is uh, supposed to be supervising our youth service officer. Currently, because of our staffing levels, we only have one youth service officer, and she, she uh, is responsible for high school, middle school, the three grammar schools in the city, as well as the alternative schools. Uh, Rice Memorial and others 
that are here. So she's been working really hard, and we hope to get her some help soon. And then our traffic safety officer, who uh, is a uniformed police officer, but his existence really is related to uh, developing data related to traffic incidents, designing enforcement plans, or working with the Department of Public Works on engineering strategies in order to make our roads safer. Then lastly, over here, we have our records division. As you can imagine, like every government entity, we amass all kinds of records, many of which need to be filed with the court through a discovery process. Others have to be uh, accounted for according to the Sec Secretary of State's retention schedule. And we have two folks that are doing that work, as well as responding to the public records requests that we get. We get about 800 requests from the public on our records. And those records could include anything from a crash report, incident report, court affidavit, or any uh, number of our video sources that we have now. Body-worn camera footage or cruiser camera footage can all be requested from the public. And then lastly, this uh, acronym here is our, is our Human Trafficking Case Manager. We have a grant-funded position through the state of Vermont. And this is an advocate that does direct service work with survivors of human trafficking. What human trafficking looks like in the state of Vermont right now is really the sex trade related to substance use disorder. So those individuals engaging in the sex trade in order to sustain their drug habit and the coercive elements that keep them in that world. So <clears throat> that's kind of us in a nutshell. There's about 54 of us in the, in the whole organization. And as it stands right now, we have eight vacancies eight police officer vacancies. So 20% of what we're supposed to have, or I'm sorry, yeah, 20% of what, uh, what we're supposed to have in terms of sworn police officers are vacant positions right now. And that's really a, a phenomenon that we're seeing, or a trend that we're seeing across the country. <clears throat> so, you know, how do you go about running a police department? And I know that everyone really focuses on the tragic event of 2020 in the death of George Floyd. But really, there were other watershed moments leading up to 2020 where the profession should have been much, much more responsive. And actually, back in 2015, President Obama recognized this and established a commission that published a report. The report was entitled 21st Century Policing. And really what the commission was was uh, six experts that went through and identified what was going well and what wasn't going well. And it gave police leaders a playbook, if you will. And uh, they kept it simple for, uh, for our profession, which I appreciate. And they published six pillars of uh, policing, of contemporary policing, to kind of guide ways in which law enforcement executives could take this schematic compared to the needs, the public safety policing needs of your individual communities and figure out how to lay those over one another. So I just kind of want to walk through what we've been up to since 2018 in terms of the pillars in 21st century policing here in South Burlington. Pillar one, <clears throat> building trust and legitimacy. A lot of this comes down to how you just simply relate with the, with, uh, the public at large in being approachable and also being responsive. So like when I talk about we have an employee dedicated to providing public records in a timely fashion, that's an excellent way to be responsive to your community. Another way is to be pro very proactive in ways that you communicate with the, with the public when there is something on the national radar that's gone terribly wrong in policing, like what we saw in Memphis, in getting information out to, the, to our community, to our constituents, about how we would deal with that situation. And oftentimes, what we've seen in my statements, are, are really uh, an indictment against some of the things that we've seen going on in this country. Policing in other areas, in the South and in the West, far different than in the Northeast. Far different in terms of philosophical alignment. <clears throat> Another way to build uh, trust and legitimacy is also keeping abreast of best practices in training and in policy, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But in really ways that have been meaningful to the community of South Burlington, we have uh, one of the most restrictive fair and impartial policing policies in the state of Vermont. 
where uh, we do not cooperate actively with uh, immigration issues, civil immigration issues. And that's really meaningful to the state of Vermont when you think about the number of migrant laborers that we have working on our dairy farms, or what we see a lot in this city are people that are housed here in hotels to revamp those hotels or revamp a McDonald's who may not be here uh, uh, legally, but it's a civil violation and not a criminal violation. So uh, we're pretty proud uh, of that work as well. <clears throat> we'll go into pillar two, policy and oversight. Again, I touched on this. It's critically important to look at uh, high liability areas where you need to make adjustment in policy and where you need to orient your supervisors to pay attention to field operations. Like I said, we have a sergeant on each shift that works with that team of officers. So that group of four together professionally for a year, and that gives us a great opportunity to have a good barometer on each shift of how employees are doing in terms of early intervention. If our policies are working, and they're working in a way that we're trying to meet the, police expect, the policing expectations of the community, and if not, let's recalibrate, look at best practices around the country, and implement those here. <clears throat> Pillar three, use of technology and social media. So there's, there's two things really kind of layered here. Uh, a way that we've implemented technology is uh, in 20, must have been 21 now, we finally got body-worn cameras on all of our police officers, as well as they are fully integrated with our cruiser cameras, and the system is completely intuitive. What do I mean by that? So if an officer turns on their blue lights in response to uh, a call for service, once the blue lights are triggered, the cruiser camera comes on, the body camera comes on, and everything's recorded. So we can offer going back to pillar one, a complete record. So it is a perspective when we look at video, but a complete independent record of that police public interaction. And uh, that is work that we're very, very, very proud of. It's also a system that <clears throat> is state of the art in terms that it is cloud-based digital uh, evidence. And it literally transmits through a router off the up to the antenna in the police car to the cloud in the moment and officers that are on scene, we can actually almost watch it in real time if we, uh, it's super technology. Social media, we all know that uh, younger generations, are, that's where we find them, right? That's how we transmit information uh, to folks. And it's funny to watch kind of the demographics. We have several different platforms that we leverage at the South Burlington Police Department. Facebook, a little bit older, right? Front page, Front porch forum, a little bit older than that. But then down in the bottom space, we have Instagram and Snapchat, uh, and to a lesser degree, uh, X, which was formerly Twitter. We, uh, we leverage all of those platforms for a variety of reasons. One, we, you will see we use X, formerly Twitter, as a way to get press notifications out in, in concert with our standard media release that we all see on the television news. But then we use Facebook and Instagram as a way to socialize the police department, to let the community know what's important to the police department, highlight some of our work. And we've also been really kind of focused in this same space on our recruitment front because it's where we find applicants. We still go to job fairs. We still do some classic advertisement. But a lot of people find us on social media. <clears throat> Pillar four, community policing and crime reduction. Community policing is, it's a great term, but if you've been in this business long enough, you realize that it's how it all started, right? Sir Robert Peel talked about the police are the public, the public are the police. I wouldn't have a job if we didn't have taxpayers, and uh, we, we need to have our ideals in that regard aligned. And I'd rather call community policing relationship-based policing, because that's what it's all about. And when I think about how I started my career in the town of Woodstock, very small community, and we had um, kind of strict marching orders from the chief of police on things we would do. There was a dedicated spot downtown where you parked the police car, and on the evening shift, you'd check every single commercial door. And uh, during the day, you would do the same thing, and you would greet all the tourists to make sure the parking was in order. That's just a form of community policing, right? When I went to Burlington, I spent uh, a number of my years in patrol assigned to the Old North End, uh, which 
is a pretty tough neighborhood. And at the time, what I quickly realized is that although folks are down on their luck a little bit at times, they really appreciate, especially when you have a degree of criminality in a neighborhood, there's a fond appreciation for the police department. And there's a, a unique opportunity to really build some meaningful relationships in that regard that, one, are just rewarding, right, as humans, to be able to relate to folks, but it also cultivates information, right? And it helps when you're trying to figure out the major crime in the neighborhood. So when I think about that, and I think about the decades that, of policing that went on before, when people would grow up in a town or a city, go and be a police officer, walk the beat, maybe many of you in this uh, room had that type of um, experience yourselves or knew a police officer like that. That's really where society wants our profession to get back to. Through the 70s, uh, they made us more efficient. They put us in cars, they gave us radios, they gave us more and more technology, and they employed fewer of us in a lot of, in a lot of instances. So that's a delicate balance, uh, but we are doing some very intentional things here in South Burlington. We have <coughs> foot, uh, foot beats that we assign, University Mall, Market Street, Farrell Street, anywhere that we can interact with people, business owners, residents, and socialize uh, us as, in, as humans just out doing a job. And again, it's easier to meet before a crisis and then work through that together than it is to meet during a crisis and try to figure out, are we adversaries or can we get along and collaborate? <clears throat> Crime reduction, we'll talk about that in a, in a next slide. Pillar five, training and education. Really, if, if you uh, have un poorly trained police officers or scared police officers in the field, they make worse decisions when they're under stress. So we focus a lot of time on training our police officers so they know that they're confident, intelligent enough, and tooled to deal with whatever they're faced with. And that's critically important. Education, just a, a brief example of that. We do have a program where we have a tuition reimbursement. So officers that come to us that maybe haven't quite completed their college degree or want a master's degree, they're able to do so um, you know, as time allows. And we will help with their tuition costs in that regard. And then lastly, uh, pillar six. This is uh, that one that's extraordinarily important. Officer wellness and safety. We'll talk about wellness first. This is the whole employee. So we have a department clinician in uh, concert with a peer support team of employees. And we talk about um, mental health and also situational kind of depression, if you will. This, the cumulative stress of being in public safety can be a lot over time. And everyone kind of has their own breaking point. And we recognize now that if we do a little bit of preventative work in that regard, we don't lose employees. We don't lose employees. Um, too soon or to bad decisions that they either make professionally, where we see it in use of force outcomes, or personally in medicating themselves with substances or alcohol. So uh, we've got a lot going on positive in that regard. We also have uh, a fit force program where we afford officers, as time allows, up to two hours per week to work out on duty. We have a beautiful state-of-the-art gym in police headquarters, and many of our officers help themselves stay well, not only physically and mentally, through uh, exercise, weightlifting, and that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> that's a little bit of our work on officer wellness. And in terms of officer safety, that really comes down to having enough cops, well-supervised and trained cops, and then all the latest technology that you need to do this job in order to have the best possible outcomes when we're kind of faced with a lot of unknowns. I spoke about this challenge a little bit already. I gotta move around, I'm sorry. And I'm gonna try not to trip over one of these cords and embarrass myself. <laughs> Recruitment and retention of staff has been uh, one of the biggest challenges in the profession across the country. A little bit about our numbers here. Uh, you can see in this graph, starting in 2020, it was the last time in recent history that we were able to actually retire or have three officers resign and then hire that number back. And uh, we became very less fortunate after that. In 21, we had four separations. We we're only able to hire one. In 2022, which was really the height of the number of officers available for retirement, 
post-2020, we had six, I believe 90% of those were retirements, leave, we were only able to add three. And this is a trend that's been uh, very, very troubling. <clears throat> it got better in 2023, even despite, uh, despite kind of the deficit that we were coming out of, we were able to hire eight police officers at a time where we only had five either retire or resign. So um, right now, like I said, we still have eight vacancies. Not everyone makes it through training. And that's what we saw in our big year in 23, <clears throat> when we were able to hire eight employees. Just because we hire you as a police officer, that doesn't mean you've made it through the, through the finish line yet. You have to go to the Vermont Police Academy. It's a 17-week residential, academic, and physical program that's kind of, it's based in a paramilitary structure. It's pretty rigorous. And then you come back to your home agency in here in South Burlington. We do 14 weeks of field training before those employees go on a single radio call by themselves. Why is that important? Why are we investing uh, the time? This is a high liability career. This is a career where we're putting public safety professionals in the street that are making life and death decisions. They're making decisions about restricting uh, individuals' constitutional rights. We have to get this right, and the bedrock of getting that right is having uh, good training. <clears throat> so again, we're about 20% down. If you know anyone that's looking for a fantastic job, <laughs> we're, we're, we're uh, open to interviews right now, and we're looking to hire uh, up to four officers in July, who would then begin the academy process this August. What do we do day to day? So uh, we respond to everything that you can imagine, from barking dogs, to people fighting on the sidewalk, to people stealing from the university mall. You name it, we do it. What's that look like in terms of numbers? So uh, again, starting out in 2020, you'll see that we were doing about 13,000 incidents per year dwindles down a little bit in 2021 and that trajectory stays uh, on the decline in the 2022. Now I want you to remember this the graph previous to this one where that illustrated kind of our available headcount and number of officers we actually have to assign to these officers and there's a correlation as we have less officers essentially we are doing what we have to do and we're not doing anything proactive. And when I say proactive, what do I mean? Less foot patrols, less engagements like this that we measure with incidents, less traffic stops to try to keep our city's uh, streets safe, and uh, all the assorted things that you, you, that you could imagine that a police officer might do while they're on duty with their free time. What this is showing is that we're barely keeping pace with our radio calls. And then again, as our head count began to came, come up, our incident number uh, began to came up, began to increase as well, finishing with uh, about 11,500 incidents in 2023. Similar trend with our arrest line. I know these numbers are small. Just over 1,000 arrests in 2020 for the year. 2023, 645 arrests total. What the difference there is, more proactive, more traffic stops, more DUI apprehensions at night. Less cops on nights, fewer DUIs, fewer proactive interventions, responsive arrests, 645. What's consuming the availability of our bandwidth day to day? And a trend that has been identified in our data, graph on your right, unmet social service needs. So what this really is is a catchment of five incident types. The incidents that we respond to involving overdose, mental health crisis, welfare check, suicidal persons, and lastly, intoxication. And you'll see coming out of <clears throat> the pandemic in 2020, about uh, 749 calls for service related to those five catchment areas, up to just over 1,000 in 2023. What we see right now is overwhelmed systems of care be it related to substance use disorder, alcohol dependency, in particular, most acutely, in uh, those suffering either from formal mental health diagnoses in crisis or situational crisis. And unfortunately, <clears throat> let's talk about the fortunate side of that. How do we respond to these incidents in a way that it just isn't a badge and a gun? 
We are one of the nine towns in Chittenden County that subscribe to the Howard Center Community Outreach Model. What those folks are, less than clinicians, field-based folks that are really fluent in the services that are available. They co-respond with law enforcement or with fire to these incidents that I just mentioned in the catchment area and then try to reunite. Generally, it's reunite because folks have slipped away from services that they're familiar with or are new, new to the community and don't know what's available. It works pretty good until about 5 in the evening. And then as the programs all close down, there's only one entity left now that we can try to get these folks to. And unfortunately, it's the emergency room at Fletcher Allen. And they are totally overwhelmed. And it's, it's not the hospital's fault. Our mental health uh, system of care in this state needs, uh, in my opinion, some uh, re-engineering and reinvestment in that regard. <clears throat> Prevailing crime trends in the city, and again, I, I apologize for the size of the graph. Uh, I realize it's small. What we've seen coming out of the pandemic are exponential increases in essentially uh, a few categories. So when we talk about larceny, that's just theft. So a bicycle is stolen from somewhere, a handbag is stolen out of a shopping cart at Hannaford's, that kind of thing. Um, so we've seen <clears throat> double digit increases on a percentile basis in larceny. In retail theft, it's really been exponential. In 2020, we took 269 retail theft complaints up to uh, almost 400 in 2023. I'll tell you, uh, this year's data, we're trending even higher. Stolen vehicles, this has been uh, a troubling crime trend across the country, but here locally, it's one that's uh, really been impactful as well where we were doing you know, 23 stolen cars in 2020, and now we are up to 124 in 2023. What, what the message that we're trying to get out uh, about stolen cars is there is no uh, stolen car ring that's going on in Chittenden County. This isn't like the movie Gone in 60 Seconds. These are folks that are leaving their cars unlocked with the keys in them and folks that uh, are out and about potentially stealing from cars will uh, you know, occasionally take a car and then go out and say, do a gas drive off at a local convenience store, commit a retail theft, commit a burglary. And the first great lead that we have in any one of those crimes is the video image of the car that was stolen. So that lead kind of evaporates quickly. This crime trend of stolen cars could be mitigated almost instantly back to 2020 and before levels, if folks would just take their keys and lock their cars. I know, I know you laugh, but <laughs> it, people leave their keys in their unlocked cars. <clears throat> so, uh, retail theft, obviously South Burlington is uh, kind of a retail hub, retail uh, heavyweight, if you will. We've seen dramatic increases in the number of retail thefts related to uh, you know, instances at the mall, Lowe's. Many, many times, these are substance use disorder folks, and they're stealing in order to uh, buy drugs. We're seeing a bit of organized criminality in this regard, where drug traffickers want specific goods. So instead of taking money for drugs, they will put on, out on the street word, I want, you know, these sneakers in mass quantities or whatever the good might be. And uh, so those folks that are dependent on substances will go to the University Mall or you name it and uh, commit retail theft after retail theft. I don't know how much you follow some of the legislation that is afoot, but there is uh, our representative here in South Burlington, uh, Martin Lalonde has a bill that's going to make it through crossover where it'll allow prosecutors to aggregate misdemeanor offenses of retail theft that occur over a short period of time in order to enhance those to a felony, which we hope will be a deterrent. But a big challenge right now is with our recidivist population. Our bail structure in terms of uh, statute doesn't allow for folks to be incarcerated for just simply committing the same crime over and over and over again. 
you have to commit a serious act of violence in order for the court to impose bail or be a risk of flight. And many of our recidivists are folks that have lived in the community for decades. And uh, it's very troubling for our merchant community to see the same faces time and time again, victimizing their business. It's also demoralizing for our staff to have to go out and really replicate the same investigations over and over because a lot of these folks, and when I talk about the recidivist community, I'm talking about a number of people that is less than 50, might even be less than 30, are driving these numbers through the roof. And they're quite bold about saying, yeah, just give me my citation, the court will let me out, and I'm just gonna get a sweetheart plea deal because the court has a backlog. So uh, that's been really a source of frustration, not only uh, for our profession, but certainly for our business community. <clears throat> Uh, and then lastly, burglary, I like to highlight. Uh, burglary numbers have been fairly static. And what I mean by a burglary is when someone actually forces their way into a place that they don't have license or privilege to be in and commits a theft. And uh, in Chittenden County, I've been here like 27 years now, you can almost predict those trends on who gets out of prison that went to prison for burglary. Uh, it's one of those crime uh, appetites that never seems to go away. And I've never understood that. Some of the uh, capital improvements that we've made at uh, the police department, we're investing in hybrid police car technology now. So these cars, they cost a little bit more. Uh, they're hybrid in nature, they're not plug-in. We need that because we can't always depend on a replacement cycle throughout our patrol days of when they could actually be plugged in. But what this technology really does is manages the amount they idle. And that is where we're really inefficient in unnecessarily causing greenhouse gas uh, these, these cruisers, we have four or five of them now out in the patrol fleet. They've been out for just under a year. I'm really anxious to see the fuel consumption data. I realize that there's like different metrics in trying to uh, be more green, but I think uh, we're going to see improved fuel consumption, and I know because of less idling, we're going to contribute less to greenhouse gases. <clears throat> I mentioned that we have, or that we're home to the Emergency Communication Center, the 911 Center. So up until 2018, we were still really relying on a model, both of infrastructure and personnel, to operate a police department in a very small fire department. The fire department has grown exponentially over the years to meet the service demands of the community to include um, paramedicine and ambulances. And we needed to bring our operation up to speed. So we just finished last week a major renovation of taking our two, uh, we call them consoles, but essentially dispatching stations. We revamped the room. We have four state-of-the-art technology, uh, four state-of-the-art dispatch um, stations in that space now. All the latest technology, computer-aided dispatch for fire and EMS, full video integration throughout police headquarters and city hall, and ergonomically friendly furniture for our dispatchers. So uh, this investment today was made possible through some ARPA dollars and also uh, some budget surplus from last year. And this center will serve the city well into the future, the way it's been engineered. <clears throat> Spoke a little bit about emerging, uh, emerging issues, crime trends as it relates to our staff, our, our census really. And I just like this graph because the top line is the growth of city population. So 1970, <clears throat> sorry, so uh, 1970, 10,000 residents, and we're up to just shy of 21,000 residents now. The green line is sworn officer staffing levels, so 19 officers assigned to the police department in 1970, to a peak of 42 officers in 2010 were authorized. 40 police officers today, we've got 33 employed. What's fascinating <laughs> is the blue line. The blue line is our annual incident count. So in 1970, we had uh, less than 1,000 incidents. You can see that we peaked when we had available staff up around uh, 16,500 incidents per year. Again, we're doing more, more engagements with youth more engagements uh, with the community such as this, much more proactive enforcement in terms of traffic, which is a major concern 
in this uh, community more foot patrols, just doing a better job for the community. But then as our census begins to fall off, you see our incident count fall off. In this delta here between our population and the number of incidents that we're handling, that's a point of saturation. We simply don't have enough to provide the same, enough people to provide the same level of police service that we were in 2010, but we are able to tend to all of our calls. So I'll close with this. <clears throat> Other communities around us took drastic measures, took away night shift in Shelburne, limited a night shift to one or two officers in the city of Burlington. Our staff wouldn't have that. They stepped up. They were on a 10-hour schedule in uh, 2021. When in 2022, when our headcount fell uh, drastically, we pivoted immediately to a 12-hour schedule, and we maintained the same level of police officers that we needed to provide the city with the service that they expect, and also the safety and numbers that our team expects. But with that, I think I'm three minutes early. You're perfect. <laughs> Thank you. But I'd love to answer any questions that they have. Thank you. Get the microphone behind you. No, just, just talk. Can you hear me? I love the police. <laughs> but I love policing South Rollington. <laughs> I have a question about intake. Um, my daughter and I witnessed someone going through a car lot and, and opening, trying to open door. And we called. And the intake person took so long that by the time she was finished, they had taken some merchandise from cars, um, didn't drive a car off but disappeared. So is that something that could be expedited a little? That's a great Thank question. You. So in that, did you call 911 or did you call us direct? OK, thank you for bringing that point up. So uh, in the state of Vermont, we have centralized 911. So if you dial 911, your call is going to one of six public safety answering points throughout the state. And they have a script that they have to run through before they transfer that call to us. Uh, it works really well in rural communities where uh, you know GPS technology isn't the best, addresses are a little bit loose. It doesn't serve us all of that well. Uh, and sometimes we are behind now. I, I was a Burlington cop when we went to this statewide system. And I remember the days where I, they would get on the radio and say, disturbance on Rose Street. And you could hear the 911 bell ringing in the background over the radio. And we were on calls like that. Uh, this, this system of response makes us a little bit slower. And uh, it's also a bit fickle for us because we need to gather enough information to validate the call, understand what we're responding to, figure out if the person that's reporting this is willing to be a witness uh, while dispatching the units. Oftentimes, under our current staffing model, we'll only have one dispatcher on. And they're extraordinarily ta talented. But if that comes in at the same time as a fire call, it's very challenging. That's why we built the center out with a goal of, I missed this part, the goal of having at least two dispatchers on at all times so we can do a lot of that simultaneous work. Please repeat your qu the questions if you can. Some sure. people can't hear them. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you talked about uh, recruitment problems. Have you looked at the compensation? Is that an issue? So we have fallen behind on the starting salary. And uh, our collective bargaining agreement is up in about uh, a little over a year. So we're going to start that process uh, soon. But it's, uh, you know, it's expensive to live here, but it's expensive to tax our residents. But I will say that we do have to raise our starting salary. This is all with the hope that service-minded folks are going to step forward, too. There's just sheer lack of applicants. And uh, other police departments, like the Burlington Police Department, that offers a starting salary that's about almost, almost $20,000 greater than ours, they're facing the same kind of numbers. But they have a political situation that makes it a little less appealing to go police there as well. But we are examining that.
benefits are fantastic. So uh, <laughs> they are. <laughs> yeah, so the question, first one was, how's your salary? Next one is benefits. Benefits are fantastic. Generational difference. So policing, public safety still offers a pension. But sometimes when you sit down with someone that's in their 20s and you say, like, I'll tell them, like, yeah, I'm in my 30th year. They look at me like I'm nuts. And generationally, I don't know if the pension is going to be as appealing as portability to, the, to this next group. I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how it goes. But our benefits are far superior. And we try to really advertise that when we're seriously recruiting. We tell folks, don't look at that salary line. Let's look at total compensation. I'm coming. <laughs> Hello. I'll ask my question. EMT oh. call. All right. So give me one second. So uh, why do why do fire trucks go with EMS calls? I am not the fire chief, but I know this answer. So what happens is our our ambulances in this county are so busy that oftentimes if you call for an ambulance in the community, you might be waiting for an ambulance to come from Shelburne or UVM, all of our professional firefighters here in South Burlington are cross-trained at minimum. They're EMTs. Many of them are paramedics. So they're staffing the fire trucks and can provide that life-saving aid in the moment while you're awaiting the ambulance. So oftentimes it appears to be a co-response, and it is, but that is the rationale behind it. Uh, my background is fire rescue, and I was with the police for a uh, number of years in an SRT team as a medic, and I just wanted to ask you something I noticed uh, when I was with my department in Miami, Florida, is that uh, a lot of people were coming to our fire department and our rescue uh, and our police department from other smaller departments. Um, do you have people leaving your department? Or I know you people coming from smaller departments around uh, Vermont to your department. But any of, uh, do you have a trend of any of your people leaving to go to larger places with a better paycheck and all that? So great question. Uh, and the question is, what, what does it look like for lateral? So people that are police officers moving throughout different agencies. So being uh, the second largest in the state, but on the national scale, we're actually, we're actually a mid-sized department on the national scale with 40 officers. Uh, we do benefit. Oftentimes, we'll have folks from smaller agencies come to us, which is fantastic. We also develop fantastic employees that go on to uh, be federal agents. And uh, that's really been a spot that we've seen folks go to. We've also seen uh, senior members of the department go into regulatory roles in law enforcement. So like in this state, uh, the Secretary of State office has criminal investigators. So it's the same pay, same pension, but Monday through Friday, not working the street anymore, uh, Department of Liquor Control and other entities. So um, we don't see a lot of concern in those trends. The concern that I see is that folks that do this almost like when you enlist in the military. You know, you're young, you have this sense of service, you sign up for four to six years, and then you're like, okay, I got that out of my system, now I'm gonna go in the private sector. And we're starting to see more of that creep into policing. Uh, in the stolen car uh, category, what is the recovery rate? So our recovery rate is really high because the interest isn't in doing anything with the car. Uh, so again, stolen car rate high, recovery rate really high. Uh, the only problem or challenge, I should say, is that when the cars are recovered, because of the prevalence of the opioid crisis, people are getting their cars back, they're filled with property that was probably stolen, that hasn't been reported stolen, needles, used uh, glassine bags from heroin, and that kind of thing. And usually an empty tank of gas. That's usually when it's time to steal the next, the next car that's unlocked with the keys in it. Uh, I, I'm curious about uh, the participation of, in this case, your South Burlington Police Department with significant uh, changes in, in the city landscape, 
Last night I became aware on TV, maybe a lot of other people knew it already, uh, that there's a big plan for growth in South Burlington. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm kind of curious, at what point in that are you brought in, or is it on a consultation basis, on budget items, sort of broken out at, I don't know, as, as somebody feels inclined to call you up and ask you to come in and talk? Or is it structured in some kind of uh, ongoing way so that your staffing needs for one thing could be built into that? That's a great question. So how do we marry staff levels with development in the city, which development has been dramatic. So there is, um, there is a process that is laid out through Act 250 where public safety officials have to sign off on the bottom line to say, we've reviewed the schematic of the plan and we can or cannot provide police service to that project. So we, we are automatically involved in that. Our planning and zoning office has been tremendously busy, but they definitely bring us in proactively after they've gotten the sketch in so we can begin to think about it. It's really important on the fire EMS side when you think about like radius swings and getting the apparatus in. With us, it really comes down to what is the scale of the project and what is the intended use of the project. Um, you know, I am very proud to serve a city that is building a lot of more uh, available or affordable housing, but oftentimes certain projects will demand more services. By way of example, uh, we have <clears throat> the uh, Beacon, the former home hum on Shelburne Road, where that is transitional. Folks are coming from being houseless. That's like their first step to try to get stabilized, to move into um, long-term housing. And oftentimes, if the wrong person moves in, we go there a lot, similar to the former home hum on Williston Road. Uh, until building management gets the chi just right in the building, oftentimes we'll have a lot of responses. Or we'll see folks that are suffering with mental health crisis without the appropriate supports. And again, after hours, a lot of, a lot of phones go to voicemail except for hours. We end up waiting into those spaces. But we find success in partnering with the leadership team of those entities. So like CHT, we work really, uh, really hard to have good working relationships with all the building managers, the, you know, the people that are on the ground, and then try to wed services to that. But are we necessarily keeping pace with the level of growth in terms of our available officers? We're not. But it's hard to ask for more officers when I've got eight vacancies. But we do talk about it a lot, and city council and city management uh, are acutely aware that as the city grows um, at the rate that it is now, all services are going to have to be scaled. I have to be disciplined by the mic. I'm used to calling on people. So uh, in your talk, Sean, you talked a little bit, your experience is mainly in New England and Vermont. Uh, you made a comment that perhaps policing is, is done differently in other parts of the country, and you said New England seems to be a in your mind to be a similar way, but other departments, West Coast, South, everybody's got the same rules, right? Same constitution, but I'll tell you the tactics and philosophy in your organizational culture are vastly different. And what's the point that I want to highlight um, on the page here is that we have to be responsive to what we see in the media for things that have gone wrong and have an explanation as to how we would have done it differently, and then really a track record of evidence practice that we do do it differently. Is that? Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I have. Am I on? You're on. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, is there, people are changing careers midway, and I was wondering, is there an age limit to which somebody can apply to be in the police force. And the other part of that is, how many women do you have out of these 40 people that are in police work? Yeah, so uh, two great questions. One is, uh, remind me of your first one. Age, we'd like you to be 21. There's no maximum age, okay? We'd like you to be 21. Are you recruiting? <laughs> so uh, great question. Follow up, one of our recent hires is a, a fellow that lives here in town. He's spent a long career in sales. He's about 40. He just became a police officer. 
that is, uh, that's like Eureka Gold, when we can find that. Lives in town with life experience. Generally, we're, um, the folks that are drawn to public uh, uh, safety, like myself, fresh out of college, very little life experience, uh, but ready to go. And we've got to figure out how to harness that, train it, supervise it, and develop it into being great police officers and then future leaders. The question about women on the police force is, uh, is an excellent one because there's a lot of research being done right now about women potentially even being better or more effective police officers than men because they're not uh, so quick to act. They're not, uh, they perhaps react differently when challenged. We are fortunate enough to have uh, five women on our staff, but I will say that this, this is a demographic that we see once the family begins to evolve and there's kids in play and shift work is really tugging at the demands of the family. Many, many times we see maternal instinct take over and we lose really great qualified women to jobs where they can be, uh, it's more reliable to be at home. It's fascinating to me that this happens because my wife is a nurse. So uh, back in 1998, I was bringing a person suffering in crisis from North Street in Burlington up to the emergency room in, in, uh, up on Colchester Avenue. I called it on the radio. The radio squawked back and said, that woman was just released from the emergency room. They said, don't bring her back. So well, there's no other place to go, so I'll see him in a minute. And I got up there, and there was this, uh, I would say, a goddess, who is now my wife, that came out to throw me out of the ER. <laughs> so, uh, but again, it's a long, funny way of telling you that nursing is a 24-7 career that is, in large number, women, and that works. Policing is a 24-7 career that, in large number, is men, and I can't figure out why. Uh, can you comment a little more about, you mentioned that um, that's called catch and release. Like, what's the solution? I mean, that must be maddening. I do like the fish that way, <laughs> but I don't like the police that way. And so I'm not a proponent of long incarcerative sentences, but what I am a proponent of is accountability. And right now, the, community, the criminal justice system is simply too lethargic. And when offenders are really calculating the risk, if I do this, what's the likelihood I'm going to be caught? And then what's the likelihood I'm actually going to have any form of punishment? Right now, the likelihood of being caught in this community is high. The likelihood of any swift punishment, corrective action, low. So that's a challenge. And I will say that it's really confounded in this bail uh, statute that we have in the state where you can't be held for committing the same crime time and time again. It strikes me as though that if you've gone out and stolen from Target on Dorset Street 10 times in the month, it's time for a judge to say, you know what, you're not getting what I'm telling you. You need a little bit of time in the jail setting to see if we can figure you out so then you, we can adjudicate your case find, you know, kind of identify the root cause of why your, why your criminality is presenting and try to address that. And our system is just not, it's not there yet. And with the backlog of cases post-COVID, I don't know if you've heard these numbers in the, uh, in the press, but there is just shy of 4,000 pending cases in this county. And uh, about 1,000, 1,500 of those are from back 2020 and moving forward. And, if you think about the number of trials the court can actually hold, there's no way. So people that are justice involved or recidivists, they know that the plea deal is just going to get sweeter in the end because there's no space on the trial docket for that. You know, hopefully through this legislative session, we'll see some tweaks to the bail law. You know, hopefully through the budget process, we'll see some investment in terms of additional judges and whatever the prosecutors need to kind of clear this docket off and then maybe we can get out a more nimble system. Our hope through our work in the Community Justice Center is early intervention with first-time offenders through the restorative process, if they can truly understand the negative impact, the global negative impact that that decision has had, it has shown, been shown through uh, data in other places in the country, lower recidivism rate. So we're hopeful 
that we can help in that regard, but only time will tell through the data. Thank you so much, Steve Burke. <laughs>